Um, one thing I'd like to address uh, with everyone is, uh, what are these sessions all about? Oh, okay, okay, I forgot about that. They're all about love. And I want to address an issue of love with you all. Um, there are nearly now 200 hours of stuff on the internet about emotions, emotional clearing, emotional processing, fear, anger, parenting, children, sexuality, all these kind of things. And every one of these sessions that I'm doing is still a new subject, isn't it? So we're all doing new subjects, one after the other after the other. And yet, while I do a subject, I talk for two hours, and then I sit up the front here and I have a never-ending stream of people come up to me asking me questions. And during that time, I don't get to go to the toilet, I don't get to eat, or anything. Now, who's being loving to who here? All right. I just want to address that with you because the reason why is that many of you sort of feel like, oh, I'll just take my five minutes. Do you know what I mean? And to be frank with you, five minutes multiplied by 25 people happens to be all of the break time. Now, I don't want to get into this space where I have to go into some back room away from you all just to eat and go to the toilet and stay away until I come back. But I, so I do want at some point in time, and whether I get it or not, it's totally dependent on your feelings. <laughs> what I would like to be able to do is stay here, but stay here unmolested. <laughs> That's what I would like. Now, what I would like to do is address the emotional reason why that doesn't happen. And why it doesn't happen is that many of you sort of feel it's an opportunity to ask a personal question of AJ about something personally going on in your own life. And to be frank with you, why aren't you asking it in a public setting? The reason why you're not asking it in a public setting is because you're afraid of something. You're afraid of being judged, afraid of being criticised, afraid of... And, and also, you're not allowing yourself to see that you're not actually being loving to me. Can you see that? Because I've just spent two hours giving you my time for free, and now you want another five minutes. All right, so you need to look at that emotionally. What's going on there for you emotionally? Now, what's going on for many of us emotionally is we want to get some personal assistance on something that we're stuck on. But what have I been trying to talk to you about all through this? This is not about AJ reliance. Like, this whole thing is not about AJ reliance, it's about God, uh, yeah, God reliance, right? So, so, when I have questions, what do I do first? So, do you think I've had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions that I had to ask myself? Of course. Now, did I come to you and ask them? Why didn't I? Because this is not about my relationship with you, it's about my relationship with God. I need to go to God and ask them. I need to get my answers from God. That's what it's all about. Not being reliant on one person here on the planet who might die tomorrow. Like, like I could walk out of this venue, go up to the top of the hill there, and, and there might be some fellow who's heard about me on the internet shoots me dead. And what are you going to do then? Well, you don't need to cry because I'm still alive, but what are you going to do then? Can you see that if it's not about my relationship with God and just about my relationship with a person, at the end, sooner or later, that's going to get really challenged, isn't it? Right? So what I'm saying to you is, firstly, see this as your relationship with God. If you've got questions that you want to ask me personally, look at all of the material that's on the net now and watch all of that first. And then after all of that material is presented and you still feel none of it applied to you, then maybe come up and ask me. Does that make sense? That's what I feel. That's what I would do myself if I, if I was listening to that material. Now, I'm not trying to make myself inaccessible. What I'm trying to say to you is that if I give my time to you for two hours, then you need to respect the fact that I've loved you for two hours and I need to have a bit of personal time now 
to go and have a bit of fruit to eat and maybe go to the toilet, which I needed to do, so that we can come back at the time that I said, which was now 25 minutes ago or whatever it is, rather than, rather than be 25 minutes late, which affects all of you in the end, doesn't it? It affects all of our discussion then. And this is where we need to look at where we often become quite self-absorbed or selfish in our feelings. We want something specifically for ourselves, but we're willing to sacrifice the good of everyone for ourselves. And this is a very common emotional injury that needs to be addressed. Why do we want to sacrifice other people for our own emotion? Right? For the, really, in the end, for the avoidance of our own emotion in most cases. So my suggestion is, if you feel like you need to ask me something, look at why you're asking me rather than God. Does that make sense? Now, I don't mean to... Now all of you go depressed on me, right? <laughs> what's, what's that about? What's going on there? <laughs> Allow yourself just to feel about this issue. Right? Many of you, and, and one of the reasons why we have stopped staying with people, myself and Mary, is because every time we stay with somebody, they then feel it's a carte blanche, basically, to, from dawn to dusk, question me. Right? So, so I come along and do a presentation, and then we stay with somebody, and from dawn to dusk, there's question after question after question after question after question. And while I don't get time to live any of my own life, I don't get time to enjoy Mary, Mary and myself don't get time to deal with our own emotions. And, and so in the end, it got that way that we can't stay with anyone because it was just like this constant barrage, if you like, of demands that are coming. And it's a very big issue that we face. You see, once we start progressing spiritually and then we get stuck, we then want somebody else to get us over that hump. But the truth is we're stuck because we have resistance inside of ourselves. And if we talk to God about our resistance, if we talk to God about what we're afraid about and why we want to resist, then we'll progress much more rapidly on this path. The more dependent you become on me, the less you're on the path. Does that make sense? That's very important to understand. Because this path is not about AJ reliance. Then it would be like your pathway to AJ, right? And trust me, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want a pathway to God. And all I'm doing to you is explaining to you this pathway to God. That's all I'm doing, right? And that is something that you can practice yourself. And it's going to require diligence, humility, desire for truth and love in your life. So examine where you're not being loving in your own life. And this is why I bring it up, is because sometimes many come up to me. Now, some come up to me and just give me a hug. Now, of course, that's pretty loving. And they ask me how I am. But it's very rare, by the way. In almost, almost every session, I rarely ever get asked a personal question about how I am. All right? But I get asked lots about, can you tell me about this? Can you tell me about it? Can you, you know, lots of stuff. Which we could easily be asking in this public setting, could we not? And the only reason why we don't is because we're afraid of something. We're afraid of maybe exposing our personal life. We're afraid of exposing our personal emotion. But what's the divine love path about? Being real everywhere. So, so if you're afraid about exposing your personal emotion, then are, are you being real now? You need to deal or feel with this, feel this fear that you have instead. So from now on, I will not be answering any personal questions except in the forum that we're here right now. Does that make sense? And I'm doing this to show to you that you are able to ask questions without judgment in a forum like this. Because when I notice any judgment coming from anyone else, I'll point it out to them that they're judging you. Right? What we want to do is get to the stage where we can be totally open, totally honest, and totally free with each other emotionally. That's where we want to go with this. And we want to be able to feel that this entire place 
is like just this sanctuary of openness and reality where we're being emotionally real with each other constantly. That's what we want. And where you're not reliant on me to progress to God, but rather you just rely on God in your progression to God. Now, I'm perfectly happy to give you all the truths I know. And as time, as I progress, there'll be more of those truths that I'll be able to tell you. But don't feel that you need me in order to get to God. Because these truths are now out there, that's all you need to get to God. And that's all you need to attract your soulmate, which is the subject that we've been discussing. And if you can just allow yourself to feel about that, then that will help you a lot with those projections. Dennis, could we have a mic up there? Thank you, No worries, Dennis. What, what are you thanking me for? <laughs> yeah. No worries. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> One of the things I had to do personally all the way through my own progression is to look at my own feelings that were a lack of love, right? And one of the biggest things that was really hard for me to face was that every time I had an expectation of someone else, I was out of harmony with love. So even if I had an expectation that they treated me nicely, I was out of harmony with love. If I had an expectation for them to love me, I was out of harmony with love. If I had an expectation that they care about me, I was out of harmony with love. And what I'm trying to do here with you is start addressing those expectations with you as well. Does that make sense? Why do you expect these things? Why do you expect that I can actually sit up the front and talk for two hours and then also give you personal attention? Can you imagine as this grows, and it's going to grow, right? As it grows, what do you think is going to finish up happening? There's going to be a million people you know, emailing AJ. And then after a while, you know, you're going to have a million people emailing you because you know me. Are you going to be able to handle that? No, you're not. And nor am I. Right? In terms of physically handle that. So I'm not saying this out of pride or anything. I'm just saying that the truth grows. Right? When the truth is spoken and it's told, it grows. It's going to grow. This is why it's growing. It's going to continue to grow. You're going to be people in the end who will be looked upon just like you're looking upon me at the moment. And I'm saying you're going to need to resist it just as much as I'm trying to resist it with you. Does that make sense? Because in the end, this is not about you, it's about their relationship, whoever is contacting you, with God. And all you need to do is tell the truth of that, and then they need to desire something from that. Can we go to Janine? Hello, AJ. How are you doing? Um, I'll be truthful and honest, if I may, right now. Of course, always. I, I haven't... I've watched all the DVDs quite frequently, spend a lot of my free time. Yep. The last time I said something in public, I squirmed, and I'm squirming right now. Right. So that's a real, real problem. Yep. However, after what you just said, I yep. stood waiting for the chance, possibly, to convey a message to you. Yep. From Jackie, my very close friend, a lot of people in this room know her. Yep. Uh, she's actually dying, and we possibly even a fortnight's time she won't be with us. Yep. And she wanted me to tell you, she could have emailed probably about six weeks ago when she first knew, and she felt that that wasn't personal enough, just emailing you. Yep. And each time I see her, she says, oh, Jeanette, would you be able to just tell AJ that I'm dying? Yep. Now, I committed today. So now I'm doing it in public because yeah. it's the only way to do it. Yeah. And I knew when I was standing there waiting for you for 25 minutes yeah. or whatever it was, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that I was doing something I shouldn't do yeah. because you need your food and, you know, just... But I had this commitment now. And this is one of your emotions, Jeanette. And I'm doing it now, and I'm feeling a bit stupid, and I probably That's won't okay. even watch no, the DVD. It's really good that you, you mentioned this. 
Oftentimes we feel drawn into doing things for friends that they will not do for themselves. All right? Now, now this is going to sound really harsh, and uh, and you should know me well enough by now to know that I'm not a very harsh person, but it's going to sound quite harsh. It doesn't matter if the person's dying or not. Whenever they are demanding something that you do for them that they won't do for themselves or they don't have a desire to do for themselves, they are trying to manipulate and control you. So, so, she is. When she first learned it, she was certainly able. Didn't she not? Six weeks ago, she was certainly able. Yep. But she didn't. Who knows, I might have visited her if she had done so. Agreed? I might have. Right? And the question is, why didn't I? Why didn't that happen? Now, she's dying from cancer, right? Of the lungs. That's right. Mm. And this is one, something that's also going to sound very harsh. Cancer, we talked about this in a session when we went traveling with cancer. So I did a whole half a, half a thing about cancer. Cancer is a projection, is a suppressed projection of anger towards other people in order to control them so that you do not have to feel a feeling within yourself. The feeling she has is one of deep grief within herself. This is why it's affecting her chest. Right? She has very deep grief within herself, but she doesn't want to feel it and she wants everyone else to feel it with her or for her, and this is why she has it. One of the reasons why she asked you this to tell me this is because she wanted to know why she had it. Yes, that's okay? right. And this is why she has it. Because she's wanting other people to do things for her, right? and pressurizes them, just like she's pressurized you into doing this for her, and it hooks into one of your emotional injuries, which we can talk about in a minute if you want. And what that does is it pushes you into doing something for her because she's unwilling to feel something for herself. Right? And so what I'm saying is, if she contacted me six weeks ago, we might have even been able to talk about what the emotion was and by now she might not even have the cancer. Because that's how fast things can change if you want to deal with the emotion of it. Right? But this emotion, which is affecting her chest, is relating to sadness that she doesn't want to feel and instead wants to actually control other people rather than feeling this sadness. And so it's a very really angry type of controlling projection she has on others. Now, because she judges her that anger and the control, she would, ne she would find it very hard to admit to that. Do you follow me? And, and you even find it very hard to hear what I'm saying to you about it, because you feel that I'm actually being harsh or hard on her. All I'm doing is saying the truth about it. That's all. all right? If she contacted me six weeks ago, we could have talked about this. But, you know, obviously now it's quite advanced, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And always look at when, I, when anybody else tries to get you to do something for them or you feel drawn into doing something for someone else because they seem to want you to do it for them because they don't do it for themselves, there is always some very heavy projections coming at you that you're hooking into through some addiction of your own. Do you understand that? So I can just sit here and project it, I can project at you something about this auditorium and I can project an emotion at you if I choose to do so that if any of you are sensitive, you will, some of you will eventually start to get up and do what I want without me even saying a word. Right? So, for instance, like some of you are a bit cold, some of you are a bit hot. Now, I can hook into that and project that you turn off, turn off the turn off the air conditioner. I could just even do a simple thing like that, and one of you eventually will get up and turn off the air conditioner for me. 
Was I loving to you? No. All right? And I, can have to, I, I don't have to say a word and it can all happen. And I can even think sometimes, and I've seen people do this, think that that's really great. I'm so powerful. I'm not such a powerful person being able to do that. But it's not harmonious with free will or love of others. So we, got to, we have to look at why we feel so strongly that we can get other people to do things for us. I spent 30 minutes talking to somebody in the break about this issue and she did not want to admit that she was projecting that others should have done things to, for her. Right? And so my suggestion is to look at when you have a desire that others do something for you, look very strongly at what is motivating it inside of them and yourself. So what hook do you have into doing it? So when you might go ahead and do it, what do you feel after it's done? Some of you feel like, oh, I did something for someone. Isn't that wonderful? You feel good about yourself, that kind of thing. Sometimes some of you feel resentment or whatever. But the issue is to look at the emotion, to look at what's going on inside of ourselves when we have these interactions going on with others. What I would like to see is the entire audience here of people actually taking full responsibility for their own lives in every possible way. Full responsibility for your own life materially, full responsibility for your own life with relationships, full responsibility for your own life sexually, full responsibility for your own life in a spiritual sense, in your relationship with God, every single sense. But for many of us, we don't want to do that yet. We want other people to do that for us. Right? And it's a big emotional injury we have on this planet. This is why we have a lot of the problems on the planet with regard to love. Because we want other people to do things for us all the time that we are unwilling to do for ourselves many of the time, much of the time. Yep. We can just go behind it, Louise, and then... Just wondering, some of those things, um, those addictions, I've found in my own progression that I've just stopped doing them, um, but I haven't really grieved anything around them. Yep. Um, so I feel I'm growing a bit in love, but there's not really any grieving going on. What's going on there? Um, a lot of times with de dealing with addictions, we don't even need to grieve. A lot of times what happens is all we need to do is face the truth and, uh, and we'll automatically do things different from that moment. But the truth does have to be felt. So it's, it's not something where we can face the truth intellectually and then it will change, but rather the truth will be felt emotionally in us and then all of a sudden that will cause a shift in us and we won't do that anymore and we won't even desire to do it anymore. So look at where you still desire to do something because if you still desire to do it, then the emotional error is yet to be released. So let yourself connect to the error. Many of us still have these demands that we place upon others all the time. The demand that others be loving to me. That's a demand. Nobody has to be loving to you. And people say, but, but surely at the end we'll all be loving each other. I say, yes, that's true, we will. But if you demand it, you're not loving. Right? So demand, emotion, like love does not demand anything ever. I had a talk about this, if, some of you may not have heard it, but we had a long talk about this, uh, these issues and even the issue related to cancer in I think the Armadale discussion so for those of you who haven't heard it, my suggestion is to download that from the net and have a listen to that because I talk about the demands that we place on others and how unloving they become. I cannot even demand that you treat me nicely. Right? No matter how I treat you. I can treat you beautifully for the rest of our lives that we spend together and yet you can hate my guts and I can't demand that you do anything different. Right? And that's what love will do. If we're in, if we love others, that's what we'll do. Because love is a gift. And one of the most important things you will ever learn emotionally is that love is a gift. Love is a gift that you give to others, that comes from your heart, and love is also a gift that others may give to you when they want it to come from their heart. Does that make sense? 
And if I can understand that love is a gift, I will stop placing unloving expectations and demands upon others. One of the things Mary's written around our house is, love is a gift. <laughs> you, you'll see it actually if you come to our house. She's got it plastered up on the, near the doorway actually. Love is a gift. Every time I demand love from others, I am being unloving. Because love is a gift. I reckon? Um, I, want, I was thinking to say sorry afterwards, but I changed my mind. Say okay. sorry. I was the one push her to talk to you because I felt threat. She said she wants to go home. I don't feel well. Yep. And um, I thought, ah, oh, she's going to. Uh, drop off from the divine love path. I yes. have to do something. No, I was so threatened. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and I you were pushing her to do something that she wasn't wanting to do for herself. Yeah. We, we show her downstairs how to do and show my screaming and everything, but she just still, yes. No. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, I pushed her. And to I won't you. To discuss her private life. No, um, no. But. The issue is that every time you feel impelled to do something for someone else, pushed into it like that, and yeah. you were being pushed into it, yeah. even though she wasn't saying the words, yeah, but I was, you, I was threat- Peter, and yeah. some others were <laughs> yes. being pushed into Indeed. her talking to myself, yeah. and it was done in a very unloving way to yeah. myself. Yes, yep. sorry, I, yep. I knew I was, right. <laughs> I was checking, oh, is it not eating up? Oh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, um, so the issue is, to look at why am I responding to this unloving demand? Yeah. And do you know what? What happened to her in her past and what she wanted to talk to me about actually ended up being about this exact issue. Oh, okay. About how she's been demanding of others in the past. Oh. And so what happened when she I couldn't get what she wanted. I wasn't loving towards her too. I was responding. You were responding to the demand yeah. of an older woman or a woman who you view as more powerful yeah, than yourself. I know my mum. So, yeah, <laughs> look at the relationship with the mum and how that played out there. Mm. Peter needs to look at the relationship with mum in exactly the same way. <laughs> yeah, we both are the same. And both have the same injuries. <laughs> yeah. And it was hooked into in exactly the same way. Oh, okay. yep. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. That's why you notice that it didn't happen when you initially wanted it to happen, when you first introduced us together, her, oh. her and myself because I could feel the demand mm. and I didn't want to respond to the demand. Oh, she was saying uh, not talking anything and she just, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. And hopefully she may listen to that, I don't know. Yeah, and yeah. I look at myself too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very important for you, for you guys who hooked into that to actually feel what you were hooking into. You were hooking into this feeling from her that she was projecting at you and that feeling is related to your mums and how that you know how you were manipulated by your mothers. Mm. Yep. AJ, about a month ago, um, I did write to Jackie and said I'd, I would ask you about the cause of her cancer, and it never happened because there wasn't a question and answer, and so I didn't do it. Yep. But was that me taking on responsibility for her? Yes. Yeah. If I had cancer, I would yeah. want to know the cause myself. I, I have had so many people come to me asking me for the cause of somebody else's cancer mm. and that somebody else in one occa- in, in, in a number of occasions that somebody else was sitting right next to them okay yeah now how yeah. did that happen yeah that person like i had one couple come and the man the man who his wife had cancer and was going to die within she'd been given three months and the man was asking me why his wife had cancer mm-hmm. And she was sitting right there next to him. Mm-hmm. And I turned to her and said, uh, do you want to know why you had cancer? And she looked at me like I was strange. And you know who answered the question? Yes, she does, he said. <laughs> mm. yeah. Can you see how much control she had over him? <laughs> yeah. he, he was more concerned for her life than even she was. Mm. Yeah. Right? So there's a lot in that emotionally. For, and by the way, I'm not... This is very important to understand if you do have cancer. It's very important to understand the causes of cancer. I am not judging you for those causes. They come from emotions within your childhood, in most cases, where you learn to, to manipulate other people through certain emotional projections. right? And that has become such a strong 
powerful force in you that your own body system becomes so upset by it that you eventually eat yourself away with it. That's what happens with cancer. It's such a damaging thing to do, but, but under, if we can understand why it's caused, we, you think about it, as soon as we say the word cancer, everybody around us drops what they're doing oh. almost. Oh, isn't that terrible? What happens straight away? Is straight away it's assumed that I didn't cause it. Right? But if I say I've got something else, you know, quite often I don't get the same sympathy, do I? Why is that? Like, do you hear people with renal failure getting the same sympathy as cancer patients, for example? The reason why is most cancer patients are projecting this emotion which causes the demand, which causes society to respond to the emotion, which actually is the emotion that created the cancer in the first place. Right? So I'm suggesting we need to be really honest about that. What is the real creation of these event of these of these illnesses? And could I just also get your feedback about like the first half of today? Um, I have some shame, which I feel I shouldn't have in this day and age. But um, it's to do with like, I have some too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. Like twenty years ago, I had a relationship with a man I thought was my soulmate. This yep. was a different man. Yeah. Yep. And we had a child together, and then he left me after a couple of years. Yep. And um, I was really heartbroken and didn't go out with anyone for seven years and yep. just grieved. And I don't think I got to any core emotions, but I grieved. And you were very sad about the effect. Yeah. But yep. what happened to me sexually, I started being attracted to women. Yep. And I, but I was really ashamed of that because, you know, I come from a very traditional redneck sort of family. and. Yep. And I didn't ever act on it apart from projecting, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I'm sort of confused about my sexuality. Like, I think I suppressed it and that seemed to dissipate. Like, I just feel like I've gone back to being totally heterosexual. Yeah. But I'm not sure because of that shame I had about it. Yes. So, can yeah. you talk a bit about bisexuality and where it comes from and maybe a bit about sure, with can, me? Yeah, yeah that would be good. Who else would like to know that, by the way? Uh, there's always other people who want to know the same thing. So, yeah. Well, this, what, this discussion is going to get back down to the emotions that I wanted to talk to you about. Is that okay? So we're off this subject of cancer. That's another time. And we'll talk about the subject of emotions and, and how it affects the soulmate relationship. So let's talk about that. I'll just clear off this a bit. So let's, let's, trace, let's trace the events, if you like, for yourself, Louisa, in terms of what happened. So firstly, if you look at your relationship, so here's you, sorry about the drawing, that's not quite an accurate reflection. And, and you first, like, so you were married, were you, to this man? But you were in a partnership with this yeah, man? Yeah, for a couple you of years. You lived together? Um, no, we lived near each other, and but we had a child together, and we were together for two years. Okay. Now, this is very important, too, that yeah. you lived near each other, but you didn't actually live together. No. So these are all important factors, right? So, so one, we lived near each other, had a child together, and how did you feel? Well, towards him, I felt he was my soulmate, and so you um, obviously felt a deep connection with him. Yeah, right? and like it's still not resolved. He hates me to this day, and would never have communication about resolving that, and it's really affected our child. Did you leave, leave him, or did he no? Leave he you? left me. He yeah. left you. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And when he left, you grieved for seven years. Yeah, I never. I didn't go out with anybody, but. I started feeling this attraction towards women, as well as men. I was it's and a bisexual. Started to thing. attract uh, yeah. to, to women. Okay. Okay. For some reason, I drew the man above the woman there. Sorry about that, ladies. Let's deal with that issue. That was just a trigger, Louisa. There. <laughs> right. So you had this relationship with this man. <laughs> it's it's still a bit above the <laughs> my, my excuse I'm left handed. <laughs> you can see how a lot of my writing goes also anyway. Don't 
Don't worry, it's something I need to process still. So. Was he taller than you? That's the reason. Anyway. <laughs> All right, let's look at what's happening from an emotional perspective. All right. Firstly, why did you not live with him? Um, he didn't want to. Like He had two children and he had a lot of grief. His middle child drowned on their property and he never wanted to have a child and then I became pregnant mm -hmm. and he's sort of hated me ever since, even though our daughter's beautiful and wonderful being. And Can you see straight away your law of attraction was that you attracted a man into your life who was resisting a relationship with you? Yeah, yeah. Can you see that? So the question then has to be asked, what inside of yourself would cause you to attract a man into your life who actually doesn't really want to have a full and complete relationship with you? What emotion inside of you would cause that? Um, well, I was, my father wasn't present and he wasn't loving to me. Good on you. Yeah. yeah that's good. So, yeah. so dad was not present, not present. And dad wasn't loving, not loving. So can you see straight away you're beginning with this... Um, you're beginning with this thing of like men not present, men are not going to be loving to me before you even entered the relationship, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's this unhealed emotion there, right? Now, what kind of a man are you going to attract with that emotion? Obviously, the kind of man you got. Yeah. Right. Who is not wanting to be present? How did your father feel about children? About us, he had no time for us because he was. My sister died of a brain tumour when she was six and he had a lot of grief and he hated women and... Sister sister died? Yeah. And he was bits... So his daughter died? Yeah, yep. financially pressured by all her medical bills. And so okay, yeah. okay. Can you see his resistance towards having children, your own father's? Yeah. Can you see what kind of man again? He's, he's resisting having children too now. Can you mm. see he didn't want to have children with you either, did he? Uh, sorry, my father. No, I mean this. Oh one. no, no, he, he didn't want to have a child, but yeah. I felt this compulsion to have this child. So okay, um, I think I've really forced it, and he's just hated me for the last twenty-two years. So as a result of that, for yeah. even though Jean is such a beautiful child, yeah. and woman, he was sort of felt like he was forced into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Can you see how much of your father was in this man? Yeah, at the time I didn't see it because my father was verbally violent and aggressive, whereas and James was a softer sort of man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But so, so you you dealt with some of the verbal violence and aggression. Yeah. But the rest of it was really your dad. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And can you see how easy it is, is it then to attribute this person is my ideal, like my? Yeah. Yeah, doesn't it feel very, so doesn't feel very good, does it? Well, honestly, I really thought he was my soulmate. Yeah. It, there was such a strong love and, you know, everything. Yeah. yeah. But was it really? Well, he's just been such an asshole for the last 22 <laughs> years, so. It sort of died in that, has it? It's, but the truth yeah, is that you, you attracted a man who is really like your father, except for one or two major issues, one of the violence, the violence and oppression. That wasn't there. But aside from that, you're attracting mm. a man who's like your father. He doesn't want to fully commit to you. He doesn't want to be present you with you in a relationship. He doesn't even want to have a child. He had his own daughter pass. A son, it was. Or son, oh, that was my pass. sister who his died. Own, yeah. His own child passed, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so, therefore, he didn't want any other children no. because of the pain of that Guilty. that he had. Isn't that so similar to your father? Yeah. Can you see how yeah. close that is? Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Now, can you see how we can then attribute this group of emotions as if that's the ideal man? Yeah. Isn't that scary? Mm, that is scary. Right? And this is why it's so hard to tell who's your soulmate without you working on your own emotions. Yeah. Because now when you look at this, this kind of a man, what do you feel about this kind of a man now? <coughs> if the yeah, man's not maybe. present, how does that feel to you now? Well, it just feels so unloving and unrespect disrespectful. And, totally. Yeah. If he's not loving to you now, how does mm. that feel for you now? If he doesn't well, want to commit I, to you fully, how does it feel yeah. now? Just 
yeah, just horrible. But I've taken, I've see, I felt guilt all these years, thinking I just must have been this horrible person, you know, that no. he would hate me so much. Yeah, he he yeah. Uh, he only hated you because he f he felt the fear of being forced into having a child that he yeah. didn't want to have. Yeah, and he's so afraid of dealing with the grief of his own yeah. loss of his own yeah. child that he can't even contemplate feeling that mm. grief. He'd rather hate you for the rest of your life than feel that grief. Yeah, pretty and sad. I, yeah. Yeah. But that's what he—that's what he's like, right? Now, let's take this to the next step of your question. Mm. Your next part of the question is: Why did I then feel attracted to women? Mm. Isn't it quite obvious? Yeah. Well, I've had it. I've Someone had it over here. Says, "Yeah." <laughs> I've had a bit of a bad run with men from okay. my father and brothers. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this is what's so important to understand: yeah. is that many times our so-called sexual attractions are not really based around sexual attraction at all or soulmate mm. attraction at all, but rather are based around avoidance of other types of emotions. Now, if I can get back to, you remember the sex and sexuality talks? I think you were there present, Louise, I think. You remember I said how we basically have chakras in our body. So there's the guy and there's, well, sorry about that, but he's, he's a bit out of shape, but anyway. Here's the lady and we have chakra points in our body, right? That are, that are facing outwards from the front and also to the rear. The rear is about intention, the front is about what's actually happening. Now if we're open at a certain area and the other person is closed at a certain area or opposite in, in the opposite state in that area, then there'll be a flow of energy between the two of us. And then if, you know, the, there's a flow of energy in two chakras, now it's going to start to feel like a big attraction. Mm -hmm. And if there's a flow of energy in three chakras between us, there'll be an even more flow of action. Now, this man had to have a certain set of emotional characteristics that matched your father for you to be attracted to him. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So your your chakras, your feelings and emotions which generate the energy coming from your chakras have to have a certain emotional condition satisfied in the receiver before you will have a flow of energy from yourself to them, a flow of emotion from yourself to them. And this is what is causing almost all attractions on the planet is that we have a certain set of emotional injuries which are very unique to ourselves. You can see how unique it even had to be right down to a child yeah, dying, dying and everything. We both had that, yeah. That's how unique it had to be, right? And once that emotional state became satisfied by a man, it doesn't even really matter what he looks like to a degree, although he would probably have to look very similar in physical shape to your father at his prime. Mm -hmm. And you have all of these different things go, and all of these connections start to occur and then that's what draws you in and you feel inexplicably, 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 in, can't, inexplicably <laughs> Very. connection to, to this person, yeah. right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and he would have to have the flip side, if you like, of a lot of these emotional injuries, right? So he would have to be a man who's not present. So you're the giving woman who wants a pre who, who thinks she wants a present man, but actually you don't, because yeah. that's through your child, your injury. What you want is a blocked up man, and you feel sexually drawn to a blocked up man. Does that make sense? Mm. And you feel sexually drawn to a man who's not quite as loving and not quite like doesn't want to fully commit to you. Feel sexually drawn to a man who's got no time for children. Feel sexually drawn to a man who has even had a death of a child. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. And that creates this strong, strong binding force, which then triggers my mind into thinking, maybe he's my soulmate. Oh, I believed it. Exactly. Yeah, no, it wasn't a joke. Yeah, yeah. no, no, yeah. I understand yeah. completely, because I've been there myself. Yeah. Right? Mm. I understand completely that what this is like. The person matches your own condition in terms of its mm. flip side so accurately that all of this energetic reaction occurs between the two of you, and before you know it, you're in a relationship, and you feel like that person's your soulmate, and that person probably highly likelihood not mm. your soulmate. But anyway, yeah. we can say you know even if they are, they've got a complete mirror injury of yeah. my own oh, of my own injuries. Mm. Now, now once that is established, and we get very hurt. So in that relationship, what happened for yourself is it just triggered more of that childhood hurt that you felt with men, and exposed that the childhood hurt that you feel with your father and your brother's treatment mm. of you. Yeah. 
And so now what happens is now I get into this state of like men are just like to be avoided. So what's the only thing that's going to connect to me now that I've got that additional emotional baggage now? Is a woman who connects to things similar to my relationship with my mother. Mother. Mm. All right. And that will start triggering certain things inside of me as well. And I might even start to feel sexually attracted to that kind of a woman. Yeah, well, that's what happened, yeah. Exactly. Mm. And so what happens then is we're setting up all it. So we then say, oh, maybe there is this such a thing as bisexuality because, you know, I've been sexually attracted to men and I've been sexually attracted to women. Mm. And in reality, even the sexual attraction you had to the man was based on an injury, as is most probably the sexual attraction you have to a woman. Mm. And what I would like to do with all of this discussion is get down to the main point of it, and that is when we open our soulmate part of our soul, and this is very important for everyone to understand, when you open the soulmate part of your soul, the only person you'll be attracted to is your soulmate. So if you walk down the street and you're attracted to three women as, you walk, as they walk past, you have not got the soulmate part of your soul open. And if you walk down to the women and you're attracted to three men, doesn't matter. When you, it's the same deal. You have not got your soulmate part of your soul open. When you've got the soulmate part of your soul open, the only person who you can feel an attraction for is your soulmate. Now, most people will hear that and they go, that is so totally out there, right? It's like, <laughs> like, how, and most men in particular, they go like, nah, you know, it's like, <laughs> us men, we were created for, you know, sex and procreation and all this stuff, right? And, you know, we gotta sow our wild, sow our wild oats or whatever it is. And, um, you know, there's this really strong projection that, that that's not the case. The way God designed you, is that eventually, once you open the soulmate part of your soul, the only person you can be attracted to is your soulmate. Now, for most of us, that is a terribly scary feeling. Can you see why? I'm sorry, I'm just going to ignore the questions for a little bit because I want to make this point. Can you see why? Because basically what you're doing is you're putting your entire sexual life in the hands of this relationship. Now, can you see why most people don't want to do that? What do they do instead? So if it was going to take five years between now and you dealing with a whole group of emotions before you meet your soulmate, that really means five years of celibacy. How many of you are going to handle that? <laughs> right? What's that? How does that song go? If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with, like, you know. That's the viewpoint of the planet pretty much, isn't it? Like, if you can't make love to the person that you really want, then just be with any person who does the job for you. <laughs> I know that sounds uh, maybe funny, but in the end, it's quite sad when you think about it. Because what we're doing is we're actually compromising our own soul so much, right? Because in the end, you have an eternal existence, right? So what's five years in that? Not very long at all. Agreed? Now, if, if, if we've got five years where we're actually working through our emotions before we attract our soulmate, that's a good five years well spent, in my opinion. Now, for many of us, it won't take you that long. You do, you start focusing on some of these soulmate based emotions and start opening up this soulmate part of your soul. You'll be surprised within a year, a year and a half, two years, you'll have come across your soulmate. You'll probably know who it is. If they're in the spirit world, they'd be with you. You'd feel them. If they're here on earth, they'd probably still be with you. You'd feel them. You'll attract them into your life very rapidly. The issue that we face, and if getting back to your questions, Louise, is the issues that we face is, I have, and this is very important to understand, I as the male have a group of emotions that prevent the soulmate part of my soul from opening up. 
And the female, my soulmate, has a group of emotions that prevent the her soulmate part of her soul opening up. So Mary had a whole set of emotions, didn't you, babe, that were preventing this soulmate part of your soul from opening up. From grief right the way through to feelings like, I want to have control of my life, I want to have control of who I meet, I want to have, it's not fair, all those kind of emotions, right? And I had a whole group of emotions, mostly grief, and for my, for my sake, because I was unwilling to feel my grief about the loss of my soulmate relationship. Many of you are unwilling to feel the same kind of grief that got into you from your parents and so forth, from their relationships. And, and those emotions blocked me from actually attracting my soulmate into my life. So, so what do I do? Do I do what AJ did some of the time and that is go searching for your soulmate? Or do I instead focus on dealing with my emotional condition that will attract my soulmate? Obviously the second one makes a lot more sense because it's also a lot more in harmony with the soul. Your soul is much more powerful than most of us realise, right? The instant you deal with a group of emotions regarding your soulmate will be the instant your soulmate will go, well, it's sort of like strange, it's really strange because your soulmate starts making choices that they wouldn't make before. And a lot of times they don't even understand at the time why. It's only when you get together and discuss what happened that you start realising, oh, while I was feeling that, you went through this. And oh, while I was feeling that, you went through, oh, isn't that amazing? Like, you know, you start realising the linkages that have actually occurred between yourself and your soulmate that have been there all that time, but have just been prevented from being experienced because of the emotional injuries that each half has. So, getting back to this discussion then, if I focus on dealing with my injuries as a mother, and if you're a female, you focus on dealing with your injuries as a female, and I focus, so I focus, there's two types of injuries I'm going to have to deal with here, right? Two types. I'm going to, as a male, have to deal with what it feels like for me to be a male. So in other words, I'm going to have to deal with my injuries about myself. Does that make sense? So, for example, some of the injuries I've had to deal with, that I have felt most of my life very, very responsible for women's pain. This has come from observing 2,000 years of women's pain and feeling like I didn't do enough in the first century to stop it, but also comes from the fact that after I passed in the first century, my soulmate experienced huge amounts of pain right down to being tortured to death, right? which I've felt responsible for in this life. And so I had to deal with all these things that I'm to blame, I'm this, I'm that, as a male, right? I had to deal with all these issues inside of myself. I also have to deal with the issues, the injuries that I have, injuries I have towards the opposite gender. Or if, if I'm in a... Uh, homosexual soul mate situation towards the same gender. And so that's one, two. So two main, the other two main things. Now in amongst all of that is a huge set of beliefs that I have. Belief systems about all sorts of problems and issues that I've got belief systems about even being controlled and manipulated by relationship. So in other words, I might say to myself, I want to be, have, be in a relationship, but I might have an injury where I feel alone all the time that I need to release. And I might have an injury at the same time that I don't want to be vulnerable and open emotionally to the other person, the other gender, which I also will need to release. Can you see that when you start looking at the soulmate tide of a relationship, you start, you can start making lists of, like in my case, I made, Mary's now seen a lot of the lists I made, but I made lists of 30 or 40 pages of injuries that I could see that I had towards meeting my soulmate. Now when you make that kind of a list, you feel a bit frightened at the beginning. <laughs> right? Because you sort of think, 
when am I ever going to <laughs> you know, sort that issue out, right? <laughs> but you'll be amazed at how rapidly a lot of those injuries can dissipate by actually connecting with causal emotion because a lot of them dissipate very, very rapidly. Don't be afraid to come to a full recollection of your own state. Uh, most of us are very afraid of that. We, we get real freaked out about that, right? We worry about that. It's just a list, and all it is is a list that God can help us work through to get to a point where we no longer have blockages towards our soulmate. So my suggestion is to look at and do what you've just done here for us, Louisa, basically. You listed one of your relationships. You listed what your father was and how this was similar to the relationship. You then believed he was your soulmate and you could see the relationship going on there. And then after that, you felt very hurt. That caused you to shut down towards the male quite a lot, right? Yeah. Which you yeah. can recognize now. You really shut down yeah. quite heavily towards the male. And that then causes you to flick into this altar side, which is, oh, I need to be, I need to be attracted to someone. I need physical affection. I need love. I need attention. I need security. I need these other things, right? Where do I get them from? If they're not going to come from a male, they have to come from a female. Like I didn't act on it because I was ashamed of that. Of course. Yeah. 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 And there's no need to be ashamed of it. Yeah. The key, the key is just to see what the dynamic mm. is that's going yeah. on. Mm. Yep. So I would then work through my shame of being connected mm. to the female. Do you know what I mean? Like allow yourself yeah. to work through that, but also allow yourself to work through all of those injuries about the male. You know, yeah. how domineering, you know, and all those other things yeah. they were, didn't want to be with you, all those other things. Now, when I talk about opening the soulmate part of your soul, there's another very, very specific thing we need to do besides dealing with our emotional injuries towards the gender that is our soulmate. All right? And this is learning about what I would call learning about having a pure longing or desire. All right? So let me just write that down. Pure longing or desire. Now, desire and longing is such an important thing to understand. Is it starting to get too warm now for everyone? Should we have them on for a bit? Um, pure longing or desire is such an important thing to understand. Many of our desires or longings are not as pure as we'd like to think they are. Right? For example, I'm lonely. I'm so lonely, I'm Mr. Lonely, ain't got nobody to call my own. You know how the song goes? You heard that one? And uh, so I'm just there in this loneliness, you know, just feeling this loneliness. And, and so what am I projecting at that moment? What's the projection I've got? I want someone to make me not feel lonely anymore. So I don't want to feel my loneliness uh, I want to make somebody else, I want to have somebody else to help me not feel alone. Uh, so that's the emotion I'm avoiding. So yeah, have I got a pure longing for my soulmate in that condition? No. I've actually got a projection that I would actually classify as a nasty projection at my soulmate that my soulmate has the job to make me not feel alone. Now your soulmate doesn't have that job actually. Your soulmate has no job whatsoever, actually. So in other words, your soulmate's not there to cook for you, clean for you, love you, make you feel not lonely anymore, or any of those other things. Your soulmate's not even there to love you, hey. Because remember, every time I have an expectation or a demand upon someone else, I am being unloving. So my soulmate has the choice to choose to give me the gift of their love. And they're allowed to choose to not do that too, by the way. Does that make sense? And I have the choice to give my soulmate the gift of my love. And that's all. That's all I have. And I won't even expect that she is faithful to me. I won't expect that he does what I want. I won't expect that he goes out and gets money to work for, for us as a family. I won't expect that he builds me my house. I won't expect that she cooks me my meal. I won't expect any of those things. 
I won't even expect for her or him to love me. I will just give them the gift of my love and enjoy when they give me the gift of theirs. Right? Now, if you imagine yourself in that state, now we've got a pure longing. So we can have a longing or a desire for somebody, right? And it's actually a desire to give them all of yourself. Does that make sense? Now, can you see how even that can be tainted quite a lot? Because many of us don't have a desire to give somebody all of ourselves. We don't even desire to know all of ourselves, let alone give all of ourselves to someone else. Right? What we gen generally do is we have a desire to not have you know this about me. I don't want you to know that about me. I don't want you to know that 10 years ago I did this really shameful thing. Right? Or this really disturbing thing that I still find disturbing. Right? So I just close that bit of my life off to you. Now there's this bit left. And then I decide, oh, that's not going to be the right colour for you. So I just close that bit of my life off. And then I start blocking bits of my life off, right? Because I'm afraid to be totally open and vulnerable and exposed. Well, you've seen what happened to me. What happens to me when I expose myself to you? What happens? Like most of the time I get attacked and abused and all sorts of things happen, don't they? Like I've been totally open with you about my life and what has everyone done with that? They grab this bit and then manipulate that bit and do this bit to that and do this bit to that and before you know it there's this terrible attack coming up you. How do you feel about that? Well, if you were open and vulnerable you would just let yourself feel about it. That's what you would do. Now imagine if your own soulmate does that to you judges you, does this, does that, you're going to need to feel all that. How hurt is that going to feel? It's going to feel pretty tough, right? But you're still going to need to do that if you want to stay open. You see, most of us have deep emotional reasons why we don't want to completely open to another person. Right? And we need to face them because when we face them, we will then have a pure longing for this other half of ourselves. Right? That's what will happen. Quick, thanks. We go to the microphone. Just yeah, with Rick, and then <coughs> just back on a little bit earlier. Yep. Um, you said that if your soulmate part opens, that you won't be or you won't be attracted to other. But what if you've still got an emotional injury that causes you to continue to? I don't know. Feel that. Feel lust, I guess. Okay, so if you feel lust for another person and you know they're not your soulmate, so what that means your soulmate part of your soul is not completely open yet. That's what it means. Yeah. And it also means that if you're if you have the uh, courage, you can actually look at that emotion and say, "All right, all right, I know this person's not my soulmate, but I feel sexually attracted to them. So what's going on here? What's what? What is it about this person? So you start investigating it. You don't you don't ignore it and make it all go away in your mind. You investigate it. You go, all right, what's it about this? Oh, she's actually about five foot three or four. Mm. Well, you know, describe, like, look at the person completely. What do you see? What do you feel from the person? What is it that's attracting you? All right? But you don't go up and need to talk about it with them necessarily, although you could if you wanted to, but you don't have to. You can often feel all of this inside of yourself just in the privacy of your own home. You can go through the whole thing. All right, what attracted me? Okay, she's five foot three, she's quite slim, she's blonde or, you know, brunette, who knows? She's, uh, you know, maybe quite pretty maybe. She seems to, what, what, what's the feeling I get from her? A feeling that, you know, she's self-assured or whatever it is, the other feelings. And then look at yourself and ask yourself, well, all right, what in that attracts me to her? <coughs> What inside of me? What am I looking for here? What do I want from this lady? Because I feel like I've been <coughs> gifted with the knowledge of who my soulmate is, mm -hmm. but I still do have the sexual injury. Yep. But I'm pretty confident I know who it is. Well, my suggestion is if you're confident you know who it is, stop all relationships. Yeah, I've done that. And, and then focus on dealing with every single emotional injury that you have within yourself regarding the opposite gender. And a lot of them will be sexual, where you'll feel a sexual attraction 
for somebody who you know is not your soulmate. Does that make sense? So you feel the sexual attraction. Let yourself feel that. Right? So don't enter the new relationship necessarily straight away, but just let yourself feel the emotional injuries. I just feel like I want to start to get to know her, but I've sent her an email and told her everything and haven't heard back. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, obviously your soul saying you're not ready to know her yet. Yeah. Right? Well, I don't want to know her sexually. I just want to get, get to know her. Well, that's sharing. not true either. You do want to know her sexually. But we'll oh, no, yeah. <laughs> I know that that would happen, but I don't, <laughs> you, I don't just do. want to go and jump into bed with her or anything. Well, you don't? No, yes. I don't think I do. You don't think you do? Yes. So why would you then have these projections of lust towards other women? See, if you're totally open to this person who you feel is your soulmate and you know who she is, if you were totally open to your soulmate, you wouldn't be feeling projections of lust towards other women. Now, the key is to not judge it. The key is to all right, say, I am projecting feelings of lust towards other women. So therefore, there's a part of this soulmate connection that is not open. Does that make sense? Can it not open until you deal with the emotion? It will not open until you deal with the emotion. Yep. But it might be partially open. <laughs> it's like every other connection, Rick. It's like every other connection. It slowly opens as you deal with each emotion. So, so yes, it can be partially open. But what you want is for it to be, in the end, open enough so that you can meet up together and start to converse and start to develop a relationship, isn't it? And to do that, you need to deal with a whole group of different injuries. Now, how's your soulmate going to feel, do you think, when you're walking along hand in hand with her and projecting lust at other women? How is she going to feel with that? Hopefully she wouldn't feel it. Ah! <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I want to deal with it. I'm now, trying to get in there. Now, can we just stop that for a moment? The hopefully she wouldn't feel it. What you're basically saying is hopefully your soulmate wouldn't feel who you are. Can you see straight away that? I, I, would, I would be open with her about all my injuries. Yeah. But, yeah. But, you're, but the mo I'm talking about the actual situation. You're walking along hand in hand. You project sexually and you're hoping that she won't feel that. Well, I'm sort of hoping that I wouldn't have to tell her every single time. Like, I've, I've got these injuries and this is what's going on and I do project, I don't mean it, I'm trying to work through it. Like, what else do you do? You do mean it. Hey. If you're projecting sexually at another person, you do mean it. We've got to be honest here. We do, you do mean it. And if she's feeling it, you wanting to her not to feel it is also you wanting to cover over you. Can you see that? In other words, you're not wanting to feel some of your own shame about it. Straight away, that's going to harm your connection between you and your soulmate. Because the connection between you and your soulmate is only going to work when you both are really open and truthful with each other emotionally. That's the only time it's going to work. I'm not sure how you would do that. Like, do you walk around all day saying, I just projected, I just projected? Yep. Yeah, you do. Oh, that's you do, really? Yeah, yeah. 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 Because you're totally open and vulnerable in every single moment towards this person. The whole goal of this is to become at one with her. How are you ever going to become at one with her if you can't be open and vulnerable on every, at every single moment you're with her? See, can you see that's not... Yeah, I'm trying to deal with it before I meet her. I've got a feeling I'm going to meet her soon and yeah. I really want to get in there. Yeah. I am struggling to get in there. Okay, so, so the key is to understand that most of our injuries that we see, seem to think are sexual in nature are often not. They are related to these things, you see. These things from our childhood and from our relationship with our parents. So there's something in these, every time you feel a feeling of lust in you towards another person who you feel is not your soulmate, what you need to do is come back to yourself and start asking yourself why it's there. I, I think I know what it is. I just what can't feel it. I, I, I didn't feel loved by my mum or my father, but right. it's mainly, mainly to do with mum. Um, so how do you feel about yourself with that? Uh, I just, I don't know, I just don't feel good. I suppose. About yourself as a male, hey? Like, how do you feel? Do you feel attractive as a male to your soulmate? I don't know. I'm not really sure. See, what you're doing, I feel, is going around projecting at a woman a feeling of lust in order for her to feel a sexual attraction to you. Yeah, and that's that, right. And that way, what happens is you then feel like yeah, I'm some, wanted. somebody I'm, wants me. I'm wanted, yeah. That's somebody right. wants me sexually, yep, that's so they right. want me. They love me. And there's an equation between want and love, which is not 
true, really. Yep. But there's also this feeling that I'm protecting sexually in order to get back this feeling that I'm wanted. Yep. So your addiction is to the feeling that you're wanted by a woman. And that's why I cut off that addiction. And then I found myself flirting with a guy because I just wanted that <laughs> feeling so much. Exactly. That's, that's how I strong go, oh it God. is. Yeah. That's how strong it is. Yeah. So let yourself feel it rather than getting the flirtations happening and everything. Let yourself feel how strong that emotion is inside of you of how much you need this this, this I'm feeling. not sure how to feel that. I don't get that. How do you feel that? Well, you have to feel the opposite emotion. I'm not wanted. Yeah. That's the emotion you need to feel. Yeah. So it's the flip side emotion that we need to feel in most cases. Mary, you want to? Rick, I just feel like there's a lot of resistance to actually feeling it. Like, so go with that. Like, feel your resistance about it. Like, your desire to hope that she doesn't notice or the idea of it seems ridiculous to say every time is because you don't you don't want to be that connected to that emotion so if you did you'd be like on it all the time and you you're trying you're trying to physically change things which is great but try like you've identified what the emotion is but there's obviously some really big resistance there try and focus on that and um, for all of you one thing to bear in mind is here is a core emotion so here's the core on top of the core is the resistive emotion, right? The emotional or the blocking emotion, if you like. And on top of that is the actions that we take, like anger and so forth, to resist, to, to prevent us from seeing the block. When you get to the blocking emotion, there will be some reasons why you're blocking this. So let, let yourself look at the reason why you're blocking it. One of them is shame. You feel ashamed of yourself for having lustful projections at other women. That's one blocking emotion. Does that make sense? But also there's also this addiction to the feeling of wanting to be wanted. And there's a, there's a shame about you being addicted to it. Like you feel ashamed that you're addicted to something inside of yourself. We're and often ashamed. Go on. Also, I think there's a... Um, to feel the unwanted feeling for yourself would feel very powerless. And part of the projections is feeling powerful. Mm. So if you can look at that emotion for yourself as well. Yeah. yeah. Once you work your way through the group of blocking emotions, the underlying causal emotion, which is this I'm not wanted emotion, I, I'm not wanted by a woman specifically emotion, will just will just come out of you. You'll just grieve it for a few days and it will come out of you. I touched on something. One, I had a little bit of a cry and yep. I f felt like I was just put on earth to make my mother feel loved because she never felt loved. That's would, exactly would that why. Would that be the emotion? Yep. Is yeah. that the one? Yeah, what often happens when our childhood is our parents have children in order to, to have their addictions met. And so what happens is if you can imagine it from an emotional perspective, you've got this adult projecting at you that you've got to love them but they don't have to love you. That feels pretty rotten as a child. And what finishes up happening as a child is we hook into that emotionally. So we project all this stuff and we do whatever they want in order to be loved. We, we're trying to be loved and we do whatever they want in order to be loved, but, but whenever we stop that projection at them, whenever we stop doing what they want, all of a sudden we're not loved again. And it's very, very damaging emotionally to us. It was very painful. I had a bit of a cry about and I... I feel like that was, if I had a, could have just stayed in there, I could have got rid of all the rest of it. Like yeah. that would have been the causal, but anyway. Yeah. And there may be, with all of these issues, there often are linked causal emotion. So one of the linkages is this thing that you were there for mum's pleasure, basically. Like, not from a sexual perspective, but from, from the point of view that sh whatever you love, you were there to love her. Like I've heard so many women want to have like five or ten children even, and and why do they want to have so many children? So that they're loved. Interesting, the kids have come in all of a sudden. <laughs> right? And talking loudly and everything. Many of you don't want to hear that. Right? And they feel like they want to be distracted. They want to be distracted. So in they come. En masse, you know? Because it's a big emotion in many of us that, that we were there for the parent. But the parent hasn't been there for us. And so what we do then is we start projecting, oh, we learn, we learn as adults that if I could project sexually at somebody, one of them will eventually notice me and project something back at me and all of a sudden she wants me. Like, want me, want me, want me, want me. You're going around saying, want me, want me, you know, like, and this is why the projection's there, that want me, want me. As soon as one of them feels like they might want you, bang, I've got a connection. 
and there's a feeling of lust in me or whatever, because there, there is actually a connection going on between me and that person at that particular moment that is sexual in nature. And, uh, and I've all of a sudden got this connection happening. Uh, and it's all because of an emotion that was created in my childhood before I even developed sexually. So it really has nothing to do with sexuality. It has everything to do with this unhealed emotion. And I'm willing to barter sex for it. Right? I'm willing to actually project sexually onto the other person in order to get back the real emotion that I'm looking for, the real addiction, which is I want somebody to want me. I want someone to need me. I want someone to love me. I want someone to care for me. I want, for many women, it's I want to be made feel safe. Like many of you ladies have entered relationships for no other reason than to feel safe. And whenever a big, strong, burly man comes along with a bit of weight on him or whatever, you feel safe and so you enter a relationship with him. Right? And if a short man comes along, you're not even interested. And that short man might be your soulmate. And you're just not interested. Right? Well, there's short men on the planet, isn't there? <laughs> they have to be somebody soulmate, don't they? Yeah. Uh, yes. Down the front here, freaking. Hey, I just want to share something. Since I open myself emotionally, I feel so so much pain. And about we talk about soulmates today, but I have the feeling in my family relationships, my friends, everybody, there is no love. Like yeah. I, I don't have love, and they don't have, and nobody's having love. Even a smile from someone today, I'm wondering why this person smiling at me, and. And that's a feeling I have for many, many weeks and it's stronger and stronger because mm -hmm. I, I keep, I don't want to, you know, I just feel everything is based on, on needs and we're just feeding our needs all the time, all the time, all the time, which I do all the time as well. And then I try to go away, but then I'm lonely because I know everything is, there is no love, yeah. only God. Yeah. And, and when you say, you know, maybe you can have, no sex for five years, I can see that. Yeah. But I cannot see a life without love. And the only thing I see is, you know, God's love. But I don't understand how God can see each other, loving each other. I don't understand anymore. Yeah. I can we love each other. I'm right. so lost with that. Can I answer some of those questions? Firstly, when you do come to know the truth about the world we live in, one of the biggest emotions you go through is deep disillusionment about love. Yeah. Right. And the reason why we go through these deep disillusionment about love is because we do come to see the truth, and that is there is hardly any relationship on the planet that's loving. Yeah. Right? And in fact, almost all relationships on the planet are based upon these things, needs and addictions. Right? Now, what it needs, unfortunately, is for a group of people to break the pattern. But the first group of people who break the pattern are going to feel the most unloved. So that means that many of us who are in this first fruits, if you like, of this change are going to have deep feelings of being unloved by the rest of society as a result. Family, friends and everyone. Right? You're going to feel that because yeah. you'll notice it. And I usually feel like I'm not able to love neither. Or I do sometime, but for a short while, and I'm back to... And then to you're back into the addiction. Yeah, yeah and I yeah. just go away because I just want to process my own feelings. Yeah. But I've got... I'm this place or, you know, even that what I do still now is so difficult. Yeah. You know, there is... But can I assure you of something? You will get through this phase. <laughs> I hope so. You will. Because I, I don't even have to do it. Yeah. And I... I was, I had this feeling once, I went away for two days on my own, and I found this place of, even, you know, if there is no love, how am I gonna do this? If I'm not able to love myself, not able to love God or people, then I cannot survive. But even if I kill myself, then still I'm still going no the other side. Still no and life. I feel so like stuck somewhere. Yep. I don't have any escape. Yep. And it was, wow. And the key is to feel that emotion like you did. To feel it and then to talk with God about it. Talk to God about that emotion. 
Because what will happen after a while is God will become so real to you and God's love you will feel into you so re- in a, such a real form that you'll start realizing that you actually don't need to have love from any other person other than God. Yeah, but then why, why we are all of, we're supposed to be on our own all the time? That's what God wants? No, of course that's not what God wants. But the truth is, when we're on the divine love path, we will get to a state where we can be alone and still feel like we're loved. Loved by ourselves, but also loved by God. And you do not need anyone else to love you. You see, the fact is that the majority of us believe with all of our heart that we need someone else to love us to survive. All right? I'll say it again, shall I? We believe with all of our heart that we need someone else to love us in order to survive. But actually, we don't. And that feels so terrible when I say that to you, doesn't it? Can you feel that in you? In many of you, you have that terrible feeling of, oh, no, that feels wrong to me. That doesn't feel right to me. And that's the emotional injury being triggered with the statement, right? The truth is, God is the only person who will love you completely through this entire process. Not even your soulmate is going to love you completely through this entire process. It's going to be many times when your soulmate gets upset with you through this process. There's going to be many times when you get upset with your soulmate through this process. Right? God is the only person who's going to love you through this process completely. When you feel that, that is when you'll have the most sense of love of self as well. And when you feel that, you'll also have the most bliss. But getting to where I am now, to that location, is lots, there are, there is lots of painful emotional experiences to experience. And one of the largest is that I am not loved and I've never been loved. So for the majority of you, you have never been really loved your entire life. You've had bits of love along with quite a lot of addiction aimed at you. And there's never been a time when you've been consistently loved even. Right? When, if we look at love, love is a gift. How many times were you just given the gift of love without an expectation in return? How many times in your life? For many of us, we could name it on one hand. How many times in our life that happened? Uh, where we actually remember being given a gift without somebody not expecting anything back from us. And particularly in our closer relationships, we end up having this interaction of addiction. So it might start out that we felt like giving, but then we started noticing, oh, I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm giving, but I'm not getting much back. And then we start getting hurt about that and do you know what I mean? It starts triggering these childhood emotions that were created in us. So the, the key thing is to allow yourself to feel these really deep emotions. They are huge emotions yeah. and core emotions to your progression. But even if you, I know that, but even when I know that, I still... Try to get out I, of it. It's just, yeah. it's just the hardest things it is. I experience in my life. Yeah. <laughs> it's big. On the, on the divine love path, you are going to experience emotions that you've never experienced before that are going to be the hardest things you've ever experienced. And, and the key is to just come to t- terms with that emotionally, that this is going to happen. And so, so, yes, your whole life often is governed by addictions. For most of us, we have never been really loved our entire life. Uh, now you imagine for many of us that means like in 50 years I have never been really loved or 60 years or 70 years I've never been really loved. That's a long time to not be loved, isn't it? Like to, f- to feel totally alone. Right? And then we start, once we grieve those emotions, we start getting into this other place where we realize that actually God's love's been there waiting and just wanting to be given to us but we've actually been also denying love our entire life. In other words, by our our own addictions, we have been preventing ourselves from being loved for much of our life. 
and we start going through that group of emotions, that's pretty tough too. And if we allow ourselves to feel those groups of emotions, we will heal this part that connects us. And particularly if we deal with the intergender stuff, we'll connect with our soulmate. But if we even deal with the other stuff, we'll connect with other people and you'll start noticing loving transactions. Many of you now have this feeling of overwhelming gratitude when you're loved, don't you? Like You notice that? How you'll be, you'll be meeting with someone and all of a sudden somebody, somebody does something for you. Someone you might, you might not even know, right? That it's not on the divine love path or anything, but they just do something for you and you just feel like crying because they did it for you without having any addiction to getting something from you in return. And you just get overwhelmed by it. It's very powerful. If we go up to if we go up there with the microphone and then down there. If we start there first. Um, this morning, AJ, my husband and I had a conversation. Yep. Um, I've obviously just started on the divine love path and so everything is just emotional turmoil at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And so we've got really real and honest with each other about our past 12 years together. Yeah. And we both came to the realisation this morning that all of our injuries are based on not being loved. Yeah. And so we sat there together and felt felt that and realised how perfect our injuries were to come together. Yeah. And of course, we have thought that we've been soulmates for the past 12 years. And, yeah. and so I said to him in that, if we've had this beautiful connection that we thought was love, imagine what it will be like once we do actually when it is our injuries. And yeah. it was just huge. You know, I said to Mary before, either my fear, I have a fear of not him not being my soulmate after we work through that. Yeah. But if he is, just the, the love that will come from that will be just amazing because yeah. it already has been. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. And it's exactly right. Um, when, when we start acknowledging to ourselves that all of our, even all of our anger with our partner and all of our sadness with our partner in the end, is all just about not feeling loved inside of yourself. Now remember too that this is also part of do I demand to be loved? So there's, there's that side of it as well, you see, because a lot of the times we feel like, oh, if my partner only gives me this love, then I'll be fine, and I'll give them the love they want, and then we'll be fine. But that's not actually the case either. The time we're going to be fine is when I no longer demand anything in love from them. And they no longer demand anything in love from me, and we both give the gift of love to each other. That's when it gets to be fine. I realised how I had such an expectation of him because I believe he's my soulmate, that he needs to love me. And, and that he and needs I to need treat to you him. a certain way and do certain things and so forth. Yep. Yeah, because that's how, in my mind, a soulmate relationship should be. Exactly. And what the soulmate relationship should be is that they should not need to do anything for you at all. I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how powerful that's going to be if you don't need to do anything for him and he doesn't need to do anything for you and both of you are willing to give the gift of love to each other. That's when you have the most power in the relationship. That's when the relationship is the most powerful. And, and, and all the addictions do is reduce the power of the relationship. They reduce the love in the relationship. Yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like my whole relationship's been based on the addictions mm -hmm. and um, I haven't really focused too much on the soulmate thing or I don't <laughs> think I have. Yep. I've been trying to focus on my relationship with God and just work through law of attractions to get to that point. Yep. So I guess I've put that aside because I am married and I've been with him for nearly 20 years. Yep. <laughs> However... <laughs> um, if he's not willing to work through his emotions, yep. um, which I feel that I'm projecting on him as well. Yep, you are. Um, Go on. Um, I could t I, I've got about 55 things to tell you, but I want to try and narrow it down, and it's really hard. Can I just stop you for a moment, though? Because yeah. I, I understand where you're going with yep. it all. Um, the... Uh, by the way, many times you guys ask questions. I, the reason why I smile a bit is because I already know what you're asking me, yeah. and you don't need to keep going really very much. But, <laughs> and, but it's, it's good to it's good sometimes for yourself to connect emotionally, which is why I let it keep going sometimes. And um, you're avoiding quite a lot. 
to be to be frank. Yeah. The reason why you're avoiding it is because of this security, the issue of security. Yeah. Right. So, so many of you are doing a, a number of different things. Firstly, you're saying to yourselves, um, "All right, I'm in a relationship already. I don't know whether the person's my soulmate or not." Well, that's immaterial, to be frank. Like the truth is, you have attracted this relationship into your life. And if you don't know whether this person is your soulmate, it means that you have not opened your soulmate part of your soul. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that they are doing something wrong. It means that you haven't opened the soulmate part of your soul. So what do we do with that? We take steps to open the soulmate part of our soul. Yeah. So is it like a... It Will it be separate for everybody or is it just our own personal injuries that we need to... Like is it a set of things or... Um, will it be different for me? Well, remember, everything gets back to two things. Do you know what the two? Well, three things really. Do you know what they are? Three things. I keep reminding everyone of this. Three things. What's the first one? Love. Second one was truth. The third one was humility. Okay, so that's where it all gets back. So okay, let's apply this to what you now are asking a question to. Okay. Do you tell the man you're with the truth about everything you feel at every moment? <laughs> I'd like to be able to say yes, but I know you're going to say no, you don't. <laughs> well, no, you answer for you. Um, um, right, so, so when you feel he's not listening to you, do you say, you're not listening to me? And then you realise, oh. No, I don't. No. Okay. okay. So, so... How can you enter a truthful relationship? Your soulmate's going to, relationship's going to be the most truthful relationship you have ever had. Yeah. Ever. So every single thing that you withhold from your current partner needs to be addressed. Yeah. So what you do from now on is you don't withhold a single thing from your partner. I think I'm afraid... I'm afraid... Of um, because things that I do address that aren't loving, that he's not being loving to me, yeah. um, he projects back at me. So then I go into that emotion. Um, so I don't do it all the time because I'm probably in fear. I think. Yeah. So why aren't you just being? If if you say if he's being unloving to you, why aren't you saying to him you're being unloving to me? Because he tell me to. <laughs> so why are Probably. you still there? Yeah. Um, well, why I, are you still there? Yeah, I know. I try and justify this. If he's going to tell you that time. over and over again every time you say something that's unloving, yeah. like that he's feeling unloving. Yeah. And he tells you to get effed. Yeah. Then, then is this a loving situation? No. So why are you still there? Um, because I'm feeling that, you know, if he is my soulmate. No, that's not that, why you're still there. Okay, let's try number two. <laughs> B. No. Um, you're still there because you. I want to feel secure and I want to feel loved and safe and all that. And that's why. Okay. You, you are addicted. I've, I've known that, but I've thought, do I really have to leave this whole thing to feel that? No, you don't like, have to leave the whole thing to feel that. But may I say to you. If a person's swearing at you and telling you to get effed, then you should perhaps get effed for a bit and see how it works out. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. In other words, look at your own addiction as to why you can sit there and take that abuse. Yeah. There's, a, there's a reason that you can sit there and take it. Yeah. I've tried, I guess I've just tried to make it work because, like, why, for the past why? six months, because you want security. Security, okay, okay. What will happen if you if if, if he says get, get effed yep. and you get effed? Yep. Um, so yeah. So I'm trying to make the videos for children. So that's, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I started the get effed yeah, thing. That's all right. Sorry. And um, and and you actually and you stay. What's the only reason why you'd be staying? Yeah. I've, I guess I've tried not to, um, and it comes back to security. Every thing I'm going to say to you exactly. all the time comes back to that. So Just let yourself acknowledge that. Okay. So write down all the reasons and then yeah. see their link to security. 
and yeah. see that I'm addicted to security. I'm willing to be put up with being sworn at yeah. in order to remain secure. In what way? Is it physical security? Is it is it economic security? Is it emotional security that you're feeling? Is yeah. it just that you don't want to be alone? What kind of security yeah, is it? Start a bit of all of them probably. Allow yeah. yourself to see them, yeah. Because yeah. all of those issues are preventing you from knowing who your soulmate is. Yeah. Right? Now, by the way, this brings up another fact. Do not ever put up with unloving treatment from your soulmate. Yeah. And many, that's... many people I hear, they say, oh, but he's my soulmate. So? Like, so? Like, if your soulmate's abusing you, why are you still putting up with it? Yeah. And I guess that's why I keep thinking, you know, if he is, and, and, you know, I've come to the point where I've been, I feel loving enough to myself that we've kind of separated because mm. he's been living downstairs for six months and we haven't really had a relationship together at all. But that's not separation, by the way. No, I know. So that's, can you I've see the desire the secu- for security? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a big issue, this security issue, yeah, by the way. Mm-hmm. Big issue. The majority of women are attracted to their current partners because of security and no other reason. Mm. Right? And th- and this is a really huge issue for the planet to work your way th- work as work our way through. We are so addicted to f- what we call economic security that we we will o- we will make all sorts of personal soul sacrifices for its sake. And that's pretty sad when you think about it because we're willing to we're willing to actually compromise our own soul just for the sake of having some dollars around so that we don't get into a bad position. Yeah. Now, you can see why historically it's such a huge issue because women in the past have been terribly treated. Like many of your ancestors, the moment they disagreed with their husbands were kicked out of the house. And it still happens today, doesn't it? The moment you disagree with your husband, you're out. Like I I know one person who as soon as she disagreed with her husband, he smashed up her guitar and almost burnt down their house. And she didn't want that to happen, so of course she's still with him. Do you know what I mean? Mm. That that is a huge emotional projection at a person. To you know, you don't have to say anything if you do those things, do you, really? It just tells them exactly where they stand. And most women <coughs> get so afraid of that. Mm. Understandably so, because historically a lot of women ended up, you know like dying even from being just kicked out of a house and their children dying and all sorts of things happening. Like historically terrible things have happened to women and that then happens on a multi-generation level so many of you ladies have that emotion. That security is more important to you than sexual compatibility even. Security is more important to you for many, for many of you than actually having a love connection with somebody because many of you actually don't want a love connection with somebody because it feels too exposed and vulnerable. What happens if they die? What happens if this person that you have this huge love connection with just passes? How are you going to feel then? Isn't it safer to not have the connection and just enter a secure situation so when they pass you've still got some money to live? And often we have these emotions in us and we're not facing them. Does it make sense? So allow yourself to deal with these addictions. Yeah. You know, this issue of security is a big anti-soulmate barrier. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because if your soulmate's destitute and poor and a painter down on the side of the street, do you think you're going to want to see him? Mm. If you've got this security issue still within you? When, you? when you haven't got it in you, you'll meet him and go, wow, I've met my soulmate, isn't this fantastic? <laughs> Up until that time you meet him and say, I don't want anything to do with him. Like, geez. Like, I'm not going to be safe there. Who's going, to, who's going to earn the bread, you know? That's what we'll do inside of ourselves. We'll compromise our own soul union for the sake of money or for the sake of security or for the sake of almost anything. We'll, control, we'll do it until this soulmate part of ourselves is open towards the other half. Yeah. Thanks. Carol, down the front. AJ, in the Paget messages, mm-hmm. Helen Paget seems to put a lot of pressure on James Paget to love her. Like sometimes I'm reading it and it's like, you must love me you like I love you. And I think, whoa. Yep. And understand that um, when, when, a, when a spirit 
explain something through words, a lot of times those words sound de demanding and controlling. That's not the actual feeling of the spirit in the sense of like the, the, the spirit isn't demanding and controlling, but she is saying you have no idea, and to be frank with you, very few of you have any idea how much your long-term future happiness depends upon you loving your soulmate. Right? And your soulmate loving you. And when I say long-term happiness, I don't mean that you won't be un that you will be unhappy. Because when you're at one with God, you're completely happy, right? Even if you're not with your soulmate. But your long-term development after that point is going to be very much dependent upon this relationship and what you learn in this relationship. Because it's the union of your one being, your one soul. How, how more essential can you get than that? There's only one thing more essential than that, and that is your union with God. That's the only thing more essential than that. So every time you put something else ahead of this union process with your soulmate, you're out of harmony with love. Does that make sense? So, and for the majority of us, what we finish up doing is we say, oh, I'm not with my soulmate, it doesn't really matter. You know, I can have a good life, a good fun, a good time. And we're not understanding that right at that moment, we're denying a whole group of emotions within ourselves of being afraid, being vulnerable, being, you know, all these different things that we then just skip over intellectually and say, oh, it's going to all be all right. In the long term, you are, if you stay on the divine love path in the long term, you are going to meet your soulmate. And you know what? That's going to shock the pants out of you. Right? Off of you most of the time. <laughs> but out of you. Is right. <laughs> in, the sense, in the sense that your entire life will change. And all of these emotions you thought you had healed, you realise, oh wow, I didn't have that one healed either. I didn't have that one looked after either. And, right? As long as you start opening up to your soulmate. Now, the soulmate could be the person who you're married to sitting right next to you. And you might not even know until you open up this part of yourself. Does that make sense? And the key is to just go for opening up this part of yourself, opening up. Now the only way this is going to happen is the same way everything else happens. And that is for you to stay loving, stay in truth and be humble. Now every one of you who feel you've already met your soulmates, you're starting to understand how humble you have to be, right? Like you guys feel like your soulmates. How humble have you guys had to be? You can feel how humble you've had to be and how truthful. All this stuff about all these previous relationships and how you felt and all these other things all start coming out and the other person gets triggered and off they go and cry for a day or so and you feel really responsible so you go off and feel this and there's all this stuff going on constantly, right? And if you stay in truth and stay in humility, you will continue to grow. Now, all of you, all of us can put this into practice in our current relationship. So if I'm right now in a relationship, I don't know whether it's a soulmate relationship or not, right? Because let's face it, I could have 25 different injuries that would stop me from seeing that, that it's a soulmate relationship, right? That it's actually my soulmate that I'm living with. So what I need to do is start focusing on truth, and humility in this relationship. Just exposing myself completely to the other person. That means exposing every thought, every feeling, every desire, even the ones that you know they're not going to like. And especially the ones that you know they're not going to like. Because that's going to help you work through quite a lot of stuff, right? Now, most of us have a deep resistance to that. Can you see that? Like, how many times have you been fully, fully open emotionally to this person that you're with? About, pardon me, absolutely everything that you've experienced in your life. So, when me, myself and Mary hear that other people think we don't talk very often, and that we don't really know what each other feels or thinks about something, we sit down and have a chuckle to ourselves, right? Because basically, from every moment of our life that we are face to face, we are talking and expressing ourselves emotionally to each other. And Mary says a lot of things to me that I don't want to hear sometimes, and I say a lot of things to Mary she doesn't want to hear sometimes, 
and we just let ourselves feel those emotions of that. And in the process, we're actually getting to know each other again, right? even with the injuries. And that's what will happen for you. Do that. If you're in a relationship right now, try doing it straight away. Don't stop. Don't, don't put it off. Don't get into this fear place. You know, these fear places can dictate hundreds of years of your life. And I'm not talking about just your life here on earth. Fear places can dictate hundreds of years of your spirit life too. Don't get into those fear, space, fear spaces and be dominated by them. Cause it, so I'm there sitting down, think, oh, should I tell her this? Should I tell her this? Oh, I don't know. She's going to be pretty angry about this one, you know. Don't stop. Go, go and say. Tell her, him, exactly what it is that you felt, thought, acted like. And then let the emotion come up. Whatever that is, it'll come up. And if they do the same thing as you and have the same commitment to growth as you, you'll find that more and more you'll be bound together and also you'll come closer and closer and closer to knowing who your soulmate actually is. But if they resist that process, then they'll get angry and resentful and you acting out of harmony with love of yourself will have to actually leave at some point, even if it's temporarily in order to deal with that situation. So do that. Allow yourself to do that. Don't act upon things like security and other things. The only three things you need to act upon are these. These are like the core, core teachings. Do those things with God. Do those things with your soul or your partner. That's all we need to remember in the end. And when we do that, everything will work out as long as we keep doing that. Can we go to just over here, just behind you? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. AJ, I'm in a relationship, sort of. Um, we've separated, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Myself and Mary have separated sort of on a few occasions. Yep. Yeah, and um, I believe he's my soulmate, but I'm not attracted to him. Uh -huh. um, we've known each other almost 37 years, yeah. and he's been constant in his affections for me. Yep. And our biggest point of contention, apart from everything else, is you. Yep. And um, since I started this path, it's just blown up everywhere and at first I stopped trying to, first I wanted to try and convince him to come over and then I stopped because I understood what that meant mm -hmm. and then he can't help himself but be involved and, um, and I try not to stop telling him things because that's what I'm feeling and he wants to know what's going on. And today, um, again, when we talk about it, um, we start this argument and I said, if you want to tell me something, can you tell me without projecting your anger? Mm -hmm. And he goes into this wild state of you and AJ's projection, I'm <laughs> sick and tired of hearing your projection. Yeah. And I said, look, so more anger. it just keeps escalating. And I said, look, I, I, I don't want to keep going because what will happen is I'll just throw it back at you. Can I address the issue completely for yourself and him? Let's start with you. Yeah. Shall we? Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Because it's so tempting to start with him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's start with you. And one day you'll be able to say to him, you know, I asked AJ about you and he said, oh, let's start with me instead. <laughs> okay, so here's you and you've been, had this man in your life for 37 years and he's been constant in his feelings for you. But not, I haven't. But you have had not feelings for him. Well, you don't have sexual feelings for him. I, I couldn't stand him when I first met him. When okay. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
out. Okay, so you've had constant feelings, sorry, he's had constant feelings for you for 37 years, but you sort of have kept him at a bit of a distance for that time. A long distance, yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, you're saying that your point of contention is me. And I'm saying to you that actually your point of contention has got nothing to do with me. Your point of contention has actually something to do with you, not him. Could you explain that a bit more? So I'm just letting that settle a little bit yeah. inside of you. <laughs> has something to do with you and not him. How do you feel towards men generally? Um, what I've been starting to feel is that because of my past record, mm -hmm. I didn't realise that I actually resent and actually hate men. Okay, so you resent them? Mm. Why do you resent them? Lots and lots of reasons. Um, Have you made a list of those reasons? I started to, Good. yes. Yep. So There's my suggestion is to keep keep on that. Yeah. Yep. As to all the reasons why you have anger towards men. Yeah. Now remember, anger is just the capping emotion. Now all he's responding to is your anger towards him. Yeah, yes, I because I get he's he's very what loving to me and I get very irate very quickly and and I had to look at it because I felt that was really unloving. This is what I started doing and can I just stop you for a moment, though? He's not loving towards you at all. I'm not suggesting that. The fact well, that he gets I mean, angry is loving, you. loving, like you yeah. know what I mean. But the fact that he gets angry is you means he's not loving to you either. Yeah. But it all begins firstly inside of yourself. So you've got to look at yourself. So firstly, you have resentment towards the male, yeah. and a lot of emotions associated with this resentment towards the male, right? Yeah. My suggestion is start looking at the causal emotions related to that. Because when you do that, you'll find that when you release some of these core emotions, your relationship with him will change quite a lot. Now, your resentment towards the male, by the way, causes you to not be sexually attracted to men. Right? Yeah. In other words, to be quite shut down sexually towards the male. Yeah, right? I, I realise that. Now, now, because of that, you are not probably going to feel sexual attraction for any or many men at all until you work your way through this underlying anger and resentment, right? There are two things, by the way, that su shut down sexual attraction to a huge degree. One is fear. So when we're in a state of fear, we will shut down our sexual attractions quite strongly. Right? And, uh, and in particular, if the object of our fear is related to the person we're with, in other words, they're doing something that triggers our fear, we will shut down sexually towards them until we release this fear that we have. Right? The other thing that shuts down sexual attraction is rage. Right? And I'm not talking about the kind of uh, like anger. I'm talking where you have this angry spat and then all of a sudden you want to jump in the bed together. Right? I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about the resentment that comes from unhealed rage, which actually creates a feeling of hatred within you. And feelings of hatred shut down sexual attraction completely. Right? The truth is you could actually be with a person who's your soulmate and hate their guts and never be sexually attracted to them and you need to work your way through what the rage is all about. My suggestion is to actually start, instead of focusing on what he's doing with you... Okay. Uh, AJ, the thing is, yep. I, it, it was about, um, I said I, I haven't processed it, that's why I feel these things that I do, yep. and it comes back to, well, um, you and your processing, and I said, and he said I'm I'm um, so self-centred in always wanting to process my things and I said I can't do anything unless I process these things, I can't be with him or with anyone mm -hmm. and then we start arguing again and, and he, th what my question really was apart from all of this was that when I say stop we're arguing and can we just at least talk and not this argument thing um, he can't help himself, he gets even more wild and angry 
and I said, well, if I process things more, I'm managing to sit through a lot more of the anger that he's actually projecting to me. And that's trouble. Like, if you loved yourself, would you sit through somebody projecting anger at you all the time? Well, I, I didn't in the beginning. I used to say, we can't talk, we're just getting angry. But he's saying that by me walking off all the time, he can't he can't discuss things and I said well this is not discussion and then he says well how else am I going to find out about things if you don't let me carry this whole emotional because you talk about emotions all the time through mm -hmm. and on that basis I, I realized that every time he started getting angry he has to walk off and so I tried to sit there and not get angry back to hear what he actually has to say through his grief mm -hmm. and we did do this today, but it took a long, long thing and we went and I threw back a lot of stuff and, and I understand what it actually does to me, but I was trying to get it past running away from him throwing stuff at me. Yeah, well it's great that you've tried to get past that, but the issue that you're not facing is coming from your soul is this resentment towards the male. Okay. Now he's going to be feeling that 24 by 7. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So he's there feeling, I've loved you for 37 years yeah. and you just resent me. That's what he feels. Even if he doesn't know that's what he feels, that's what he's feeling. That he's loved you for such a long time and wanted to be with you for such a long time and all he feels from you is rage and resentment. Right. So, so what's happening now is that I got to that point where I know that I need to deal with it and I've had so many mother issues that I haven't got to father issues. And Can I be frank with you though? You haven't wanted to get to father issues. No, I haven't, but I've just started to realise I need to. Yeah, but need to and want to are two different things. Okay. Right. Now, can I talk about why you don't want to? Yeah. And, and this is why the situation has been a festering situation in your relationship. Mm. It's because you want to blame the male. You see, if you deal with the emotion, you won't be able to blame the male anymore. You'll have to give up the blame of the male, right? And you don't want to do that. You want to be able to hate the male because that prevents you from feeling the grief that's underneath that hatred. Does that make sense? So because you want to blame the male, it's great having a male around you who you can blame. Uh, I'm not conscious of that because I, I feel that I've been just working with my mother issues, but that's something but, I'm not conscious of. But you don't want to work with the father issues, which you know will heal this particular problem with this male. Yeah. So the truth is you don't want to heal the issue with the male. I have a lot of difficulty with it, yes. Yeah. Can I say though, you don't want to. I'm using the terminology specifically. Okay. Because, because this resentment, in, and this, this happens for many of, of, of people when we're, when we're in rage with the opposite gender, most of the time we don't want to heal it. What we want to do is continue it. Mm. We want to blame the opposite gender. We want to make them responsible for fixing it. The truth though is that this male didn't create the causal emotion in you. Mm. So you're actually blaming the wrong male. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The male that you, it would be more appropriate if we were going to blame anybody to blame would be the father who created this yeah. emotion inside of you, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what we often do is we select a person who's going to put up with our rage for the rest of our life and then we project our rage for the rest of our life to that person. And that person keeps putting up with it, 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 and so forth. Now this is what's happened to him. In the end, he's now, he's now in this state of feeling like he's loved you for a long time, feeling like there's not any emotion coming back. He's very, very frustrated and upset about it. But what he's even more upset about is that you don't seem to want to deal with the emotion towards the male. Mm -hmm. And the truth is you don't mm -hmm. want to deal with the emotion towards the male. Because if you deal with the emotion towards a male, you have to let go of the resentment, which covers over the hatred and anger, right? Which covers over the rage. What does the rage cover over? The rage covers over the fear that you actually feel about opening up yourself to a male, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you deal with that emotion, what's going to be left? 
there'll be the grief about the male that all will just come bubbling up and out and then what's going to be left? You might actually want to be with a male after that. Right? Well, I, ha I had looked at why I got angry and then I saw that I wanted to control and what does control mean? It's fear. Mm -hmm. And I got as far as I realised I was afraid and it was like, I, because I've got so many fear things, it was like I've got... It's <sighs> just so much fear and... And, and I'm trying to deal with it. Um, but it'd be more honest in your discussions with him to get rid of this discussion about AJ out of your life. Oh, I'm, it's not me who brings him up. No, no, it is you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At the soul level it is you because you want to avoid the real issue. Okay. The real issue what you want to avoid is the fact that you're in resentment towards the male. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And he's feeling that from you all the time. Yes, I, I And he's going to respond to that now. He's starting to get like tired of that resentment mm -hmm. and he's now feeling a response to it, you know, where he gets upset about it. Because he's feeling like this isn't love at all towards him. And it's not. No. Right? So allow yourself to focus on the real issue. The real issue is you have rage towards the male that you want to retain because it's a powerful place to retain your rage compared to feeling your grief. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let yourself feel about that. Like, why do I want to retain this? What kind of power am I looking for here? What type of control am I looking for here? Why do I feel like I need to control the male? What's going on deeper and underneath that? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And be honest with him about that. Just say to him, look, I realise the problem's not AJ, the problem's not even you, the problem is that I just have rage towards men. But AJ, I've told him that. No, 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 you don't understand what I'm okay. saying. I understand you've told him that. But I haven't felt that. You don't want to feel yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, so That's I've intellectually that. understood a lot of what you said. Yes. And, um, and that is probably part of the problem is that I intellectually do know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but I've put it as a barrier to actually dealing something with it. Yeah, you, you want to hold on to blame towards the male because that's more powerful than feeling the grief and sorrow that you yeah. feel as a female in relationship to the male. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. yeah. And, and while you hold on to that emotionally, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to release this rage. And so what he's going to be getting the barrage of this rage from you even before you open your mouth. Yeah. Right? So he'll feel that. He'll f We're much more sensitive at soul level than people realise. Yeah. You can feel from the other person whether they don't want to be with you or not. Yeah. Right? And they're saying something different to you, but the, feel the feelings are different to what they're saying. That's a lot of confusion comes from that. Yeah, but I don't tell him that. I tell him I don't want to be with him. No, see, that's not true either. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why you're attracting a man into your life that you can blame. You want to do this. Do you understand? Because if, because if you didn't want to do this, it wouldn't be happening. Yeah. Like, uh, this is very important to understand with your law of attraction, everyone. If it's, if it's happening, you want it to be happening. Yeah. At some level, you want it happening. So, yes, I feel you want a man who will take your rage and still love you, even though you don't have to love him. When you say it like that, yes, that's true. Yeah. And that's why you're... Now, once you work your way through the issue emotionally, you'll do one of two things. You'll start connecting to the grief and the fear that's under the rage, and you'll want to. It won't be a resistance to it. You'll want to connect to it. You'll do that. Or you'll say, I cannot be with you. That's the last time I see you. Right? Now my suggestion is to do the first. Because if you do the second, you'll never heal the emotion. But it's up to you what you choose to do. I mean, choosing the first is to deal with the emotion of fear. Fear and grief. Yeah. Yeah, about the male. Yeah. Rather than choosing to hold on to the anger with the male. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like holding on to the anger with somebody is a way of getting out of the fear and the grief. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. So, so instead of choosing to get out of the fear and the grief, choose to get into the fear and the grief, right? Yeah. And if you do that, you won't. Ha he won't feel feel an emotion of rage towards him anymore. Yeah. And he'll relax. He'll just relax, and he'll go, "Oh, this AJ is not such a bad fella after all." Actually, you know, like he'll even relax with that. He's not relaxed with that because all he's feeling from you are these feelings that are not in his feelings. He's not feeling loved by you and that's what he wants. Right? Yeah. Now, that's a different discussion altogether as to whether he's, <coughs> what he's projecting at you. All you have control over is what you're projecting at you. Yeah, him. I understand that. Thank yeah. you, AJ. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Does that help? Yes, very yep. much. Thank you. So let yourself feel these deeper emotions. What I've noticed with many uh, persons that I've met and particularly many women have, have had a lot of difficulty. Most men have the difficulty, they're in their head and they don't even get to their real emotion, right? A lot of the women have difficulty, they're in their emotion, but one of the big emotions they have is they want to be angry with the man. Because, because being angry with the man makes the man pay for all the bad things that happened in the past to them from men. Do, do you know what I mean? And so what often happens is they attract the man that they can be angry with for the rest of their life and he's willing to just sit there and take that. They attract that into their life because they want that, right? And it's very important to go deeper than this, yeah. So, and now it's pretty late, uh, I think it's quarter past six. Eh? All right, let, what we're going to do is tomorrow I will continue the discussion about soulmates because there's a lot I haven't said yet about the subject. So, so what we'll do tomorrow is continue this subject about soulmates.